Welcome to the Gaslit Nation Election 2023 Super Special. But first, here's Ivanka Trump entering the courtroom this week for her fraud trial in New York as people yell, Fraud Family. Thank you, New York Attorney General Tish James. Um, so we're going to go over our election night coverage, and then we have a very special interview. Uh, here are the major points of election night 2023. There was an undeniable big blue wave. This victory belongs to everyone who made phone calls, wrote postcards, knocked on doors, donated money, amplified candidates on social media. This victory belongs to you. Thank you so, so, so very much. And I got so many messages from Gaslit Nation listeners who were letting me know that they were making phone calls and doing their bit. This night belonged to us. We made this happen, all of us together. And to underline that point, Sister District, which was a major force in the big victories in Virginia, denying Yunkin a Republican majority and putting his political future in doubt, all right? Sister District was huge in that victory. They told us that our Gaslit Nation phone bank with them was the largest this election season. So that's us. This is all on us. We did this together, and I'm, I'm so thrilled and grateful. And that's why I've been saying since the start of the show, one of the reasons why this show even started in the first place was because grassroots power is the most reliable power we have. If you feel scared, if you feel alone, election night 2023 reminded you yet again, you're not. We're all in this together and we're going to get through this together. We're headed into a very dark year. The, the forces of fascism, they're dark money. They're going to try to do everything to win, to demoralize us. There's, there's going to be moments of terror. It's going to be a very long year. But in those dark hours, just remind yourself, you are not alone. You, we are not alone. We are not alone. And we're going to win. We're going to get through this. We have no choice. Because, you know, as we're going to get into in this episode, there's something called Project 25. It was part of Trump's big coup in 2020. And it is terrifying. So, so but first... Uh, I want to share a funny story. When I was phone banking, I got a question from a voter and I didn't know how to answer it. And I popped back into the Zoom meeting to, to ask the uh, volunteer coordinator, like, what do I do here? And I noticed that they were in the middle of a talk and, and the person talking was a Gaslit Nation listener that I recognized. And so I, knowing knowing this listener, I knew that he, they wouldn't mind if I just jumped right in to get my question answered. And that's what I did. And it was just such a funny encounter running into a Gaslit Nation listener at the phone bank. And this Gaslit Nation listener is the star of this uh, bonus episode. His name is Brock Madden. Uh, he reached out to me to learn more about unions. And so I said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be interviewing a union organizer, why don't you sit in on that interview? And when we're done, you can ask your questions. So what you're about to hear is Brock leading the Q&A with the wonderful Jasmine Lolly, who is a Starbucks barista in Buffalo and a member of Starbucks Workers United. Uh, you heard her interview earlier this week. She's back chatting away with Gaslit Nation, Gaslit Nation listener Brock Madden, who is based in Seattle and looking to organize restaurant workers. So if that's something you're interested in helping with, reach out to Brock. His email will be in the show notes for this episode. And I, we're playing, we're open up our election episode with this interview because it's a reminder if we could do what we did on election night this year imagine what we can do with unions now as we're seeing uh, to take back our power during this time of historic levels of income inequality you see the auto workers are winning gains the actors the writers they they, they together united fought back against ai taking jobs threatening livelihoods and so on so 
Um, so, so it's all arm in arm. The grassroots organizing, the phone banks, and the union building. It's the same battleground. It's the same internal power. The, uh, the same reminder that what's inside of us is so much more powerful than what's trying to divide and destroy us. And we're going to uh, overcome those dark forces. And, and there's a roadmap to do it. So, so now you're going to hear this very special discussion. And then following this discussion, just for our Patreon listeners who make the show possible and, and, and are such a wonderful group of supporters in, in keeping things going, keeping things moving, keeping our eye on the ball, um, you're going to have a special discussion just for you. And if you want to join our community, subscribe at patreon.com forward slash gaslit and you'll get access to all our bonus shows ad free and exclusive invites to events and other things. Join the conversation, join the community of listeners. It's a really wonderful group that keeps me going. And um, so, yeah, so th this this big election breakdown is for you folks. And I have also um, some special information for you as well. Some exciting stuff coming up that I want to share with you. So look out for that, Patreon listeners. Thank you, everyone who supports the show, who listens to Gaslit Nation. We could not make this show without you. And now here's Brock Madden chatting away, interviewing Jasmine Lolly. What I would love to be on the record for is that I would love to, I'm having a really hard time uh, drumming up um, support. Uh, even uh, I went to my own family members who are members of a union and they do this thing where, and Jasmine, I know you know this, you're just a barista. You're just a server. How dare you expect more? You're, you don't have a college education to do this. Anyone can do this. And so I would love to have us on the record so that I can text the 75 billion servers who all fucking hate the tip pool and having our wages garnished. I can say, hey, look, I've been invited to sit in with Jasmine Lolly uh, and Andrea Chalupa and because I want to start a union. I would love for you to listen to this so that people can understand that I mean business and I'm pissed off. And I, uh, Andrea, I love how vulnerable you've been with talking about your anger issues. I have anger issues. You know, I have stories as well. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I would love for it to be on the record only because it would help other people so they could hear the anger in my voice. Uh, because I just heard Jasmine say something that I also feel. I love my fucking job, even though I knew it didn't pay me all that much, you know. So, yeah, that's my answer there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, what I mean, Jasmine, what do you have to say? Like, how does he get people organized? And, and I think a lot of it is like complacency or just like struggling with feelings of self-worth or it just feels very daunting. How do you, how, do, what, how can Brock motivate people? I think you need to find another you. <laughs> um, I think that people, they don't think that they deserve it. They don't think that they deserve more. They're a, a lot of times, and I know you're angry, but people are scared. That is really the underlying issue. You know, you have someone that's like, I need this job. Um, and you just have to be willing to take the leap and be out there. Um, it's it's incredibly scary um, to potentially lose your livelihood because you want to unionize your workplace. Um, and it's a scary thing to talk about. I think it helps to talk outside of work or maybe just drop little nuggets of like, what do you think of the Starbucks campaign then, or you can see their reaction and then you'll know like, okay, this is my in because they're interested. Well, what do you think if we did something like that here? Like in a perfect world, if you could change anything about our working conditions, what would you change? Everyone's got something um, in regards to that. Um, I would love to make more money. Cool. Well, if we joined a union, we could come up with the terms and conditions of how we work and we can decide, hey, we want a cost of living increase. We want um, a pay scale based on, you know, experience every year you get, you know, 5% plus a cost of living percent plus a bonus for being a senior um, person at whatever job that you have. Um, servers, baristas, every job is important because the person that you're serving, they don't want to do your job. 
and you just want to do your job well and be comfortable and not have to work if you don't feel good because you can't afford to not work. So when you really like, you know, drop that little, hey, what do you think of like the Teamsters or the UPS almost just went on strike or the UAW? Like, what do you think of that? Then you'll um, you'll kind of see where they're at. If they're not interested in it, then just you know, move on to the next person, but just always keep in the back of your mind. People are just scared. I think that's what helped me not because anti-union people intrigue me. I love talking to them because I'm like, why, what is, what is the problem here? You don't want better for yourself. I've walked into stores and had conversations with people like, Hey, have you heard about the Starbucks union? And they're like, yeah, I love what you guys are doing. I, I see what you're doing, but I I don't want to lose my job. And you, and you got to respect that. If I, if I may say, um, first of all, I noticed yesterday, yesterday that it's uh, National Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, I think until October 15th. And one of the things I've realized is that if I'm going to start, when I start a restaurant union, I am not going to be able to do it without the Latin American community because it makes up so much of the restaurant workforce. Now, in my personal experience, I did not work with the Latin American community when I was a barista. I think I was a barista for about five or six years. But in the restaurant industry, um, it's at least half your workforce. But what would always bother me was this you know, language barrier. Uh, and so what I'm really excited to just say is that I'm gonna commit to learning Spanish this year, like we, like I should have already known. And I've been saying for you know 15 years, 20 years, I'm gonna learn Spanish, I'm gonna learn Spanish. This is the year because I know that I'm, I'm not going to have a movement, in my opinion, without the Hispanic community. But also, if I may just share this little anecdote, something that really riled me up at my job I was just laid off from. Very swanky restaurant. Freaking Taylor Swift's detail team came into my restaurant to have her sit there. They freaked out. Well, Eric, Ed Sheeran came in. Uh, Jack Harlow came in. It's a big deal. Well, what I'm... Um, well, what I'm saying is that this one table, and this is, I want to say this something, uh, it's very, very rare for a table to just walk out. It's very rare for someone to just grab their coffee and walk out. And if they do, it's almost always like an accident. Well, we actually did have a walkout about two weeks ago. It was a, two top, a table of two. The bill came to $75. When it came time to leave, she went that way. He went that way. And on their way out, and this was caught on camera because there was cameras everywhere, like it was a freaking casino. They watch this guy hand our busser, who is Hispanic, um, $20. And then they walked out. And our manager went to that busser and took that $20 back, Jasmine. Before every shift, we have a fresh talk, but we all gather and then they loom over us, you know. And the manager actually talked to us about that because he could hear us talking about it. I was so new on the job and I wanted it so badly. And I actually thought I did have it. That's why I was so pissed when I was laid off. I just wanted to stand up and just say, how dare you? How dare you? And like, you can't make money that was given to somebody else. And also, what the fuck do you guys need 20 bucks for on a $74 tab when Owen Wilson is sitting right over there? So, it, it, but I didn't do anything. So, like, because like the last 20 years, I've just sat quietly while, you know, I got promotions while my um, Latin American workers did not. Um, so I, my question is, I'm a white guy, uh, benefit, benefiting from white supremacy. How do I, uh, apart from learning Spanish, uh, how do I tap into the Latin American community or the minority community to get them riled up without using them, without exploiting them the way that Howard Schultz insert manager here? Ooh, well, that's really shitty that that happened. Um, my heart breaks for that busser. Just the fact that people can just take from us and they know that you're not going to say anything. It's um, what I would do is I would befriend someone at work. I mean, just because you don't work there doesn't mean that you still can't unionize that place. I mean, what an ultimate, like. Sorry, Devin, thank you so much. That was my next question because I might've made a mistake in leaving these places because I didn't want to go to jail. Uh, and um, I just, you know, I was actually trying to stage a walkout and it just didn't work out. I mean, I didn't walk out, but anyway, sorry, please go ahead. 
That's okay. So what you want to do is you want to, when you're organizing a union at work, your workplace, you want to start an organizing committee. So you want to start talking to people, gauging their interest in the union, and you kind of want to relationship map. So say you're a server that works in the morning, you know, um, the people that work at your store, so what you could do is you could make a list and you could say, okay, who's friendly? If I was, to, if this person was to host a gathering outside of work, who would show up to that? Um, if this person, you know, says something on the floor, like who turns around and looks to them? So you want to like kind of befriend those people because people trust them and they will go with what they, um, they'll, they'll be easier to, it'll be easier for them to talk to someone that they trust. Um, and then you want to make sure that your organizing committee looks like your workforce. If you have a predominantly um, POC workforce, you want to make sure that you have different people on your organizing committee um, because people, you you trust people that look like you. Um, and I think that's that's so important to just make sure that you bring people in and you have to be honest with them. Um, I am always brutally honest with people. I don't want to hide anything. I, I want you to know, like, we're walking into a battle and you could potentially lose your job over this. But in the end, this will lift everyone at our workplace. We're all in the trenches together. And I think that's so important to remember to bring people in that don't look like you. Um, talk to um, local organizers at different unions. Um, maybe find a group on Facebook or something like that. I feel like the more people that you talk to, um, stories that you learn about, you can empathize with people without tokenizing people because people just want to be involved. And then that all trickles down. If I may say that I read your um, the article, uh, I'm a Starbucks barista who doesn't qualify for all the wonderful benefits you keep hearing about. We want the different kind of company that Howard Schultz promised but failed to deliver uh, that you wrote in for fortune.com. And if you don't mind me saying, I'm 44, um, so I feel like I might be a generation older than you, maybe two or three generations older than you. Um, and what's funny is that in this letter, you really held a light to what I had internalized. That what I have run into in the beginning of my career as a barista slash restaurant worker slash chef slash slash slash, and it was um, it was this. I was trained for only a few days, and I felt completely unprepared to start work as a barista. This was the first red flag. I want to tell people the reason why I want to like start a, uh, a union is to avoid this. It, it, it is so true. That it is like almost ninety nine percent of the jobs they just throw you to the wolves. Another thing that I had internalized, you said it later in page two, things were going great at first and my store was incredibly busy. Then January hit and the hour cuts started coming out of nowhere. I went from working 25 hours to 17 or 18 hours a week. I really want to stress for the, the listener that this is just something that it's just common. You work two, three jobs a year. Uh, when I was 28, I gave myself a hernia. I gave myself a left inguinal hernia working so gosh dang much. Um and, and how it, it's it's what the, the what the why we need a union and what the general public needs to know is that how we are intentionally kept under qualifying hours for insurance that is kept away from us, which is what meant actually um, I forgot is that that's what made Obamacare so important is that we didn't have to rely on those hours any, anymore. Another thing I love working at Starbucks. I know my customers face their orders and a little bit about their life. I love being the first interaction they have before going to work. These incredible connections I have every morning are my favorite part of the job. That's another reason why I want the general public to understand that we are doing this to meet strangers, establish their needs and get them what they want and then get them out the door, you know? And I just, I just, that was so awesome for you to write that. Um, another thing, if you don't mind me saying, you say later, um, if Howard Schultz knew how any of this felt, he would never set us up to be perpetually broken mentally and physically. And that is something that I have internalized and just said, oh, this is part of the, this is part of being a server and how it does physically and mentally break you. Um, so I guess I don't, uh, I just, if I could just say one thing for this, this, uh, I don't know, this podcast is that really what, what happened was when the pandemic hit and everything closed down, when they opened back up, they said to us, you have to come back and work harder 
in more dangerous conditions for less money. Now get to work. And for the last, you know, I was someone that held jobs for a long time, two years, three years, five years, you know, since the pandemic, I can't hold up. I can't hold onto a job because of that mantra that just won't let me go. And um, so, you know, thank you for letting me go on that diatribe. I just wanted to let you know that, like, I just felt so seen and so heard. And that, that that's, you know, that it's good. It goes beyond just like, I want more pay. Like, no, I don't want to break my body. You know, I want to see my partner at the end of the night. And, you know, I got to say what has happened in Seattle since I've lived here for 15 years is that you got to make probably about $70,000 a year and you're probably still living paycheck to paycheck. So this job I was just laid off from, I know I've said a lot of things, how swanky it was, you know, really the, the, the tenured staff probably made $70,000 a year. So th- we were bullied and broken down and pushed around just so we can break even. And I, I again, that's, uh, you know, one of the things that I said, I do have a question. I hope that we do have um, some, some time. I hope, I hope it's okay if I just ask you questions. Is that all right, Andrea? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, first question. Uh, growing up, there's always this mantra of don't take it personally. Well, I am embarrassed because I feel gaslit and exploited. Thank you, Andrea, for letting me know that. Is it wrong to get emotional? If I am an emotional person, should I funnel that into the movement or should I set it aside and be an adult? No, I think the the most important, why I wrote that article is because People need to feel that people identify with you when you are emotional. Like I want to be able to make enough so that I don't have to live in my car. That hits you because that's somebody's brother, that's somebody's friend, that's somebody's sister, husband, whatever, that's, that's fallen on hard times. And for whatever reason, people just think that they, they don't deserve more. They don't deserve better for themselves. And it's simply not true. And I think if you're authentically yourself, that people will identify with that. Bottling up your emotions, it will, it comes out in other ways that maybe you don't want it to. And maybe it's considered passion, you know? I don't believe in social media. Mark Fuckerberg can go fuck himself. (laughs) However, would it be worth it to start a Twitter account to tap into the movement? For example, I'd like to spam messages from an anonymous account to try and find others in my organization that feel they've been wrongly, wrongfully terminated. Is this a good tactic? For example, I found out that when I found out that this job I just got laid off from was seasonal, I also found out the senior staff knew that. So they were all like mm. pushing us around and working alongside us while we, you know, we were like sitting ducks. And that this owner does this every year. So to be quite honest with you, if you know, if there were, for example, there were seven people total um, in the organization that got laid off this year. Well, that means that, she, that this restaurant has been open for four years. She's been doing this for every year. Seven people. There's got there's a huge a group of people who've been laid off that have gone through the same thing I have. Do you think that would be a good idea? Thank you. I think you could. Social media is so important. That's where I get like a lot of my news, a lot of my information. It it could be a great system of support. And there are people like you that are just looking. And when they see that, you'll probably get comments. Or even if you did a, a short video for like TikTok or YouTube or whatever, or even a post on Facebook, the people will come when they see it. And then they'll say, yeah, same thing happened with me, you know. TikTok. TikTok. A scary world. We're going to figure it out. Maybe, Brock, for our listeners, we could do like a, a social media gathering where we help each other learn all the different social media out there since Elon destroyed everything that we know and love about Twitter. Literally destroyed everything. Yeah, he really effing did. Um, I want to ask you a question if I could sneak in there. What are some legal services, like a labor lawyer or like a legal, like a legal website or uh, what are some good legal services for people to turn to, to sort of, like, like you said, knowledge is power. Having a lawyer in your corner, a labor lawyer is also powered. What do you recommend? How, how do you, how would you find a good one? Mm, oh, um, that I, that's not something that I know much about. Um, maybe start with your, um, your state's bar website. I don't know what it's called, you know, mm-hmm, where, mm-hmm. They have yeah. a site. Um, a lot of local communities will have um, attorneys that 
will work with um, low income people or even just talk to organizers um, at, you know, your local unions or local DSA or whatever, they can maybe point you in the right direction and understand that if you're being discriminated against um, at your workplace, there are, you know, different means and channels in which you can um, advocate for yourself. But I would maybe start there, talk to a local organizer. Any more questions, Brock? Not at this time. <laughs> Let me just say, Brock, that you're so brave. I think you're stronger than you know to come on a show like this and be vulnerable and passionate is not easy at all. And you're not alone. There's probably someone listening, several someone's listening that feel the same way that you do. And the fact that you want better for yourself and your coworkers is amazing. And that's the first step is realizing that you deserve better and you'll get there. And just because, you know, they lay you off at your workplace or whatever, you can still organize that shit. You still have the contacts. You still have the the connections there. Um, talk to different people, meet them out. Pe- try to talk to people outside of, of work because people are afraid to talk about it at work and try to make the conversation a genuine one. Thank you. Uh, I think that was probably my most important question. Like I said earlier, is like, well, now that I left the company, is it worth trying? And thank you. That was, like I said, that was most important. um, We've had baristas that have been in this fight that have been um, unjustly terminated that have still helped um, with the movement and have been, you know, even reinstated to, their jobs. So just because you no longer work at that workplace, don't count yourself out at all. Just be, you know, a a support system to the people that still work there, help them. You can do like a little bit more of the leg leg work and and get information for them. Because I have to say for the record, even though I'm not a member, a part of that company anymore, I still think they should unionize for the record. Yeah. And there might be someone there that has that same idea too. And there probably is. It's just, it's hard when you approach people at work because they don't know who's listening and it can almost put a tar, if management is around, you can, it almost like puts a target on their back. So it's like, make sure you have these conversations when management is not around, you know, even like five minutes before your shift starts or, you know, at the end of your shift, like go get a drink. People love talking about work. Sad, but true. <laughs> you work an eight-hour shift, you go for drinks afterwards, and then you just keep walk- talking about work. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, exactly. You have to vent that out somehow. And we shouldn't have to work so many jobs and for so many hours that you can't have a social life afterwards because you're so exhausted from the work that you're doing. But you deserve a union. You deserve better. You deserve to be heard. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Thank you so much, Brock. You guys are so brave. We're all, we all have to have courage now, really. It's a a time of courage and inner strength and leaning on each other's inner strength as we pull each other up through this. Absolutely. You have to be willing to fight for yourself. You have to put yourself first. And I don't think a lot of people think to do that and, you know, just surround yourself with people that think differently from you. I I learn from everybody that I meet and that I talk to. Um, I don't count out any, you know, conversation and I don't battle people either. I just let them talk. Um, We all deserve better and we'll get there. Jasmine, you are the best. Come on again. Yes, I would love to. Thanks so much for having me. Brock, Fight the good fight. You got this. You're my hero. (laughs) If you want to hear more, the Gaslit Nation Election 2023 special continues for our wonderful Patreon community. To hear this full extended special, sign up at patreon.com forward slash gaslit, patreon.com forward slash gaslit.